commonly referred to as the rock star physicist. He has been described as the natural successor for BBC scientific programming by both David Attenborough and Patrick Moore, and by some as England's equivalent to Neil deGrasse Tyson. That must feel good, does it, if you're a scientist, to be described in that way? Not by me, by David Attenborough and... You know, it's. I mean, I, I was there when he when he said it. Actually, I was presenting him with an award. It was the Radio Times Awards, I think, and so I presented him with the with the award. And he stood up to the microphone and, and said, "If I had a torch, I'd pass it to you." And then went and sat down again. And of course, there's nothing you can say. And I've thought about it since. And the, the the real answer is that there can't be a successor in the way there can't be a successor to Neil Armstrong. Because uh, David Attenborough was the, he invented the form really. Natural history documentary was pioneered by him, so he's the first and still the best. If you watch Blue Planet too, you know he's still making groundbreaking documentaries. So there won't ever be another one. The, you know, it's fifty years of, of natural history. Possibly what he's referring to in in terms of succession is the sort of popularization, humanization, if there could be such a word, of uh, data and information that can has previously been somewhat esoteric and inaccessible. And uh, I suppose that must be one aspect of your work that's difficult to quantify your personal charisma, the, your particular success. Is that something that you, how it has much impact on you psychologically? Well, I mean, the first thing is humanisation is a good word, actually, because I think that science is, I mean, what is it? It's, it's the study of nature. So and it's, it's a humble pursuit. It's about just looking at essentially small things and asking very simple questions, almost childlike questions. And why is the sky blue? And why is that leaf green? And what are those little points of light in the sky? And so with the things we find out uh, demand... I think demand a response, I mean, especially when you're talking about cosmology. You know, we're talking about the size and scale and origin of the universe. These, these are eternal questions. And so I think they demand a human response. And that's the, the thing that I've always felt. I've, when, I, when, when I was little, doing, doing astronomy, just looking up at the sky, uh, you, the, the feelings that you get from looking at those points of light and understanding their other worlds and understanding how far they are away and so on uh, are... Um, are d- deep and challenging feelings, I think. And people miss that a lot. People think of science as the thing you do in the lab with, with some batteries at, in, at school, you know, and that's science and a switch. Not questions about the origin of the universe itself. I think you're precisely correct that actually we don't spend enough time analysing that feeling and to continue the comparison between yourself and David Attenborough what one senses is is that he has a a deep love of his subject and it means something to him and he wants people to understand it and that's what you've just described is that when you are for you the study of the cosmos is not about mathematics and relationships between physical phenomena abstract from emotion but very much as somehow the experience of that emotion or the realization of that emotion or certainly the relationship between those emotions could you explain that a little further brian yeah i think i think that science the act of doing science is an emotional response to nature and you said you see it with david attenborough He, he loves life on earth you know living things he finds them fascinating has a connection to them understands that the idea that we are part of one unbroken chain of life stretching back four billion years is a powerful idea i mean i always think that you know when when you look at a a blade of grass in in the pavement probably sticking up outside through the concrete that the the history of life on earth is written into that thing so that the more the more you understand and the more you think about the things that you're looking at the more powerful the experiences and the more challenging the thoughts are. I mean, in that sentence, the the the, th- the fact that in order to understand the blade of grass, you have to understand the history of life on Earth, it, uh, four billion year timescales. Uh, th- th- those 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 I think are challenging ideas immediately, and and they're emotionally challenging ideas. So I think science is an emotional response to the universe because you become a scientist when you you latch onto an idea like that and say, I want to know, I want to know what the origin of life was so I can understand the things that I see today. So you, you see in the minutiae of life at the continuum of nature and that, that is a, 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 and through that aperture, the most profound questions conceivable uh, 
uh, we have to uh, imagine answers yeah. to them. I think that all, all, all the roads of inquiry lead to uh, profound ideas, uh, and, and, and always actually to the statement we don't know. Yeah. Right? So, so we don't know yet if we ever will uh, mm. how life began. Uh, probably it began on Earth. Yeah, you know, there are theories that it came, the called panspermia, that it began somewhere else and then got, was brought here by cometary impact or asteroids. It's possible. It's unlikely, though. But mm. the, if you think about it... Is there any... Sorry to interrupt you, but is there any significance to those theories, uh, just philosophically, I suppose, that if life was at some point interstellar or intergalactic, that it, it interrupts the narrative of life beginning of, on at this point? Is there, are there profound philosophical Oops. implications? Is it relevant? And is there any reason to believe it might be true? I think it doesn't matter philosophically because it had to begin somewhere. Mm. Because we know the universe um, was hot and dense... 13.8 billion years ago which is a thing we call the big bang and we know that there wouldn't have been any life around then I mean, it's just the physical conditions were far too extreme so life began somewhere and the way i like to look at it, it it let's let's say it began on earth it doesn't matter though it could have begun on mars or somewhere else but the, the argument's the same it means that geochemistry became biochemistry so what happened somewhere and most likely on earth is that a, a dead planet but an active planet with, with you know, the, a hot core and volcanoes and those things. Uh, chemical reactions happened in the oceans, which changed from geology and geochemistry to biochemistry. And that's a profound thing. So, so the planet did almost certainly gave birth to us, which is a quite a nice, it's an ancient philosophical idea the really? planet gave mm. birth to us but that's very likely like the true. Gaia idea I suppose that yeah that the mother earth in a very literal sense but it has to it has to have so what about the uh, the distinction between geo and bio uh, life why why is that so significant by what meter by what metric are we understanding life if there is a meteorological system that can produce life is that not in itself life well, it's, yeah, it's, so it, it's almost a semantic distinction in a way. I mean, it, you're right, it's still just chemistry. And so when does geochemistry become biochemistry? Mm. So the standard answer would be when molecules begin to self-replicate. So that would be, so, so information can be passed from generation to generation. Once you've got that, then you have evolution. Wow. And then you have life. So you've got to have some physic chemi chemical, some molecule, that can reproduce itself and the information in the structure of the molecule is passed on to the copy. And once you've got that, I think, you, you've basically got life. That is determined as biology. We can see that as biochemistry, self-replicating molecules. Prior to that, it can't be tracked or understood in that way. Yeah, if, if, you've, if you've got a system which can't pass information on, then you can't have evolution. And if you can't have evolution, you can't get... The, the, the life that we see today never mind you can't even get single celled organisms because they're very complicated bits of chemistry Are they? and the key thing is how did chemistry get so complicated and I think the key to that is that you get something that can pass information so you don't lose information you add information from generation to generation Professor Cox, this distinction between geological life and biological life seems contingent on its relationship with us as the observer and how we narrate that transition. As you said, it's almost a semantic distinction, as in it is in both forms, it is chemistry. Is it not possible that our role as observer and the way that we narrate information is the true determinant as opposed to the, the, the observable and obviously extremely significant fact that cells are now self-replicating to us as observers that's extremely significant but only perhaps to us as observers given that you know in this great scope of 13.8 billion years all that's happening is some great uh, aria of creation it's a really important point i think it, you're, you're talking about the the value of consciousness in the universe the value of civilizations um, we know of one place in the universe where there are in richard Feynman's words atoms that can contemplate atoms that's what we are mm. now, and, and that to me is that we are the most valuable structures that we know of in the universe now, now when i say that sometimes people get very 
you know, people are liable to say things like, oh, humans are damaging the planet and we're better off without them. This is nonsense. Right? The, the, the point is the most remarkable thing about our physical universe is that there are places where atoms can contemplate atoms. At one place that we know of. And that might be, we might be quite rare. We don't know. We, we've looked a bit and we've seen no sign of anyone else. We, we've, it's called the great silence. Astronomers call it the great silence because we listen with radio telescopes and we look out into space, see no sign of any other civilizations. And so it could be quite a lonely existence that we have here, but therefore very valuable indeed. Whilst I understand the necessity for science as the study of nature to be based on evidence, in fact, indeed, that is its essence, that is its modus operandi, that is what defines it, does not the requirement that until there is evidence we stay with the assumption that there isn't even though we don't know is parenthesized doesn't that lead to a sort of do you not think that somehow facilitates the dogmatic aspect of science which has meant that it's sort of science has become somewhat doctrinaire and informative <coughs> of areas beyond the humble study of nature and has become in fact a kind of ideology that leads to materialism rationalism and all of the other things that well, are on that particular evolution chain I, I i hope not because it shouldn't it because shouldn't should said, it but it, do you think it does <coughs> i'm just I'm talking about great scientists i've just not been able to drink tea properly no, so, <laughs> just, professor apparently, don't put that in your nose if you inhale it into your lungs <laughs> no that, that won't work no i've read about that no, it's the esophagus it's got to go straight <laughs> yeah, down into right. the tummy but I then there's that, chocolate and lemonade are made at a later point I think science itself, it, it, it is, it's, it's humble in the sense that it's about paying attention to small things, and that's it. So if you think about, an example would be Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is the framework within which we do cosmology, which is the study of the universe. So these are grandiose aims. You know, we talk about the origin and evolution of the universe. That's a big idea. But Einstein's theory of general relativity was conceived as a theory of gravity, which is a theory of how things move around in the vicinity of the Earth, and that's it. So it's talking about if you throw a ball in the air, what happens to it? Now, perhaps how the moon goes around the Earth or the Earth goes around the sun. It became a theory of the structure, the large-scale structure of the universe afterwards. And I think that's really cr crucial. There are very few scientists who try to begin by saying, I am going to answer the great questions. I want a theory of everything. I want to understand the whole universe. That is not the road to wisdom, actually, in science. The road to, the road to wisdom and knowledge, well, knowledge first and then wisdom, is by paying attention to small things. And then what we find, I think, because the universe appears to be simple uh, at its very basic level, that there are laws of nature that seem to be accessible to us and we seem to be able to understand and there are very few of them then virtually all ro roads of inquiry lead you to if you follow them to some depth to some well the, 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 the fundamental well I, I wouldn't call them truths because it, we have to say that we don't have the full set of fundamental laws of nature we certainly know that so the laws that we have at the moment are are incomplete, uh, then they break down in certain situations. For example, Einstein's theory doesn't work at the centre of a black hole or at the origin of the universe. So we don't have the theoretical tools to talk about what happens right in the middle of a black hole, for example. So it's more the observation of a, pa a conditional pattern as opposed to an absolute truth because we don't know what's on the either side of that pattern. Is it? Do you think they could be? They, they could just be models. They, they are, in a sense, models yeah. which are, of the way that reality works. What about? Um May I ask, um, like with, with the thing that you said about um, Oppenheimer uh, uh, earlier, mm. uh, um, I was very interested. Like Oppenheimer, you said like he, that he's it was his discoveries that led to. Well, he ran the Manhattan Project, mm. so and he became haunted by it, as many people did. You know, he, I think he felt that the first bomb on Hiroshima was <coughs> sort of horrific, but almost justifiable in the sense that it was a, an act to end the war the second one on Nagasaki I think he thought was gratuitous and he felt that the power 
that scientists and engineers had given to politicians was so great that the politicians wouldn't be able to handle it, wouldn't be able to control it. And he, he actually said in the 1950s that he was surprised that we were still here, as did many. Richard Feynman, who I mentioned, also worked on the Manhattan Project. And he said he, he was very surprised that we were here in the mid-1950s. He thought that we would not control this power. And, but actually, we, we have, uh, remarkably, up to... So, so you know what? 70 years after we got that power, we, we, we're still here. So we haven't used it again. Um, but I, th I think that, yeah, that, that Oppenheimer felt that there are great lessons for the way that we run society in the, the approach, the scientific approach, uh, which was and, and by, by analogy almost. So these ideas that I've spoke about already, that, that we don't have absolute truths in science. Um, we don't think we know anything for certain. And we are humble with the way that we approach nature. And crucially, that our opinion counts for nothing in the face of nature. If we're, We can be shown to be wrong. And, so, and, and we should be delighted when we're shown to be wrong because it means we've learned something. And that's at the heart of the scientific endeavour. And he felt those things could be translated from science to politics and the way that we run societies. And then, if we do that we would have the wisdom to control the power. This is a very beautiful ideology, isn't it? And it's sort of not underwritten by, well, as you say, uh, like the idea of approaching nature with humility, with grace, um, with an understanding that, uh, of our own limitations, seems to me like a, a, a spiritual doctrine that should be used in precisely in politics in domestic familial life this is sort of for me that is almost a universal idea that we approach nature with love and compassion because obviously what i what i was very curious about well, the one of the reasons i wanted to meet you is because i respect you enormously i respect what you've done and the depth breadth of knowledge that you have and the way that you've conveyed it is awesome but i know that as a man of science that you are i sort of famously atheistic is that right well no no, I don't think so. I mean, first of all, I reject the label because I think that it's divisive. Mm. And uh, so I genuinely think that science does not rule out the existence of a creator uh, by, by definition because we don't know how the universe began. Full stop. Mm. That's it. We don't know. Right? We, we have a, a theory of what might have happened before the Big Bang, a theory called inflation, which says that the universe was still around but doing something else. But we're still left with the question, how did that start? How did the universe have a beginning? And if so, how did it begin? The answer is we don't know, full stop. Mm. So you can't read it. So, so, so from a, the scientific perspective, it is wrong to say that science has anything to say at all about the, 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 the nature of a of a creator or the 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 the, the can be that because we don't know That's yes it. now all i say is that i don't personally have any faith i don't have a personal faith now well, uh, we can dig faith, into do, that do you mean faith as in pre-existing ideological structure that you used as a framework for your understanding of reality or do you mean faith as sort of an inward belief that there is beauty and great because when you said that humility and all that that sounded like a faith well yes yeah, so, so it, i suppose it depends and you, you could talk about this more actually how what, how you define the word i mean to me all i mean when i say that is i don't have a a, a religion that i adhere to i don't um, I, I do not know what the origin of the laws of nature is. And, and that, that's enough for me. Yeah. I, I don't really, I, I, I don't feel compelled. <laughs> I, I'd love to know, but I don't feel compelled to go further than the statement that I don't know. And I think that's, I said in one of my books, that's one of the greatest of mysteries. We, we are part of the greatest of mysteries. And for me, that's enough. Yes, Full yes. Stop. Yes, there's a very beautiful humility in that. Uh, uh, that's wonderful because uh, uh, what I was gonna say is that like that i do have faith um if it were if i have to sort of unpack it and i will for the you know for us to continue our conversation what i'm fascinated by is perennialism and patterns that are found consistently throughout human mythologies that are dislocated geographically that seem to have universal themes and ideas and that are later discovered to have relationships that can to some degree be described by science by the language of science and the spirit of science particularly as you describe it with, with 
such a um, what would I say a spirit of love e.g. for example like that it was it's curious to me that Oppenheimer as I understand and remember I'm in dangerous territory and anytime I step towards science with you on the other side of the ring like that he's, he I think he quoted the back of a Gita yeah. at the point that that, that um that of those uh, tests those nuclear tests and indeed bloody you know attacks yeah. um is it I am become death the destroyer of worlds yeah it's yeah it's, and for me like there's something what is that that in like you know this is the thing I can't get my head around and this is GCSE stuff is that contained within uh, the, as it was then this you know one of the smallest components of our physical reality with the capacity for such enormous destruction that there's inconceivable energy withheld like that I mean like the, that now the reason that I'm curious about it is because th- there are inferences in religious scripture that seem to be trying to describe that 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 within the infinitesimally small there is great power that there is limitless that all things are endowed with consciousness these are the sort of like you know when i approach religion i don't sort of pick one particular book and go right i'm with these guys and and anyone who's not with it i'd like to see them killed (laughs) like it's much more like oh my god they seem to be describing stuff without the language without the language or the capacity A, a very sort of somewhat trite example when dealing with a mind such as yours would be that you know the recent discovery of the benefits of mindfulness now mindfulness and meditation for millennia have been spoken of as valuable for the human condition to have an access to an aspect of your own consciousness that's precisely not about rationalism and materialism but it's about access to perhaps the systems that very kindly run your kidneys for you and all of that you know and and so when that's discovered and demonstrably um valuable it becomes popularized or underwritten by dogmatic science at least but there were communities and ideologies that knew that these technologies were powerful without the apparatus we had and i think contained throughout scripture people are talking about oneness unity respect for nature the uh, the nature of the soul the nature of consciousness and it's only from for me whether it's from a scientific background or religious background it's only when it becomes doctrinal or people go this is definitely the answer fuck you that it becomes problematic yeah yeah and i think i mean so i would say that i i don't think that i think the way to access um the way to build models about the way that nature works is to observe nature mm. right which is essentially the scientific method you, know? yes. you observe nature you come up with some model you test it and if it doesn't agree with what you see then it's wrong and you throw it away or you yeah. so, but so i suppose really if you think about the human condition for many thousands of years from the time when we first had such a thing it, it's about it's a response to nature so everything about being human is about responding to nature so I, I would be surprised if if people didn't in that in those responses that they have didn't didn't sort of observe things patterns and discover things uh, you know you don't need you don't need modern science to allow you to discover that the, there's a regularity in the passage of the seasons for mm. example because you see it it's part yes. of what it means to be human so I, I'm I'm not surprised that and the it, and also as you say in terms of how to exist as as a as a human being then the 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 science is not going to tell you that actually it can tell you well it would be better if you ate a little bit less fat but it's not going to tell you uh, about how to be uh, content and and happy what what it does is i think provides a framework of um not not truth i don't like the word truth you see but it, but it, you know i'm trying to get out because it, it reaches we have a, well, because we, we can always we can always discover right. things that are, are different but but it provides you a framework for example it says well the earth goes around the sun nice. and it tells Good. us that there are We've there got are that. Two, 200 billion <laughs> stars in the milky way galaxy and brilliant and that's one of two trillion galaxies in the observable universe it's getting heavy now <laughs> <laughs> but that's challenging isn't it but then yeah. what, what 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 are we to make of that humility yeah, limitlessness yeah. So, and, and I think it's one of the most interesting things that we are, we've discovered that we are uh, it, physically an insignificant speck in the universe. So you can't argue otherwise. There are two trillion galaxies in the bit we can see. But yes. at the same time, there's the idea that consciousness, atoms, contemplating atoms, might be very rare. And therefore, we can be valuable and insignificant at the same time. And this is what Oppenheimer meant by where in his lectures i spoke about them uh, not on the podcast actually but on the show earlier that 
he talked about the, an idea called complementarity, which comes from it came from the early quantum mechanics studies, people like Niels Bohr and others. And it is actually, it comes from Eastern philosophy, I think, this yes. idea that you have to hold mutually contradictory, apparently mutually contradictory ideas in your head. You have to in order to get a full picture of reality. And uh, th now that's true in interpreting quantum mechanics. Yes. And what he said is what you've already referred to is that people have known this for a long time, that y you also have to do it to understand the human condition and yes. how to run a society. And it's a, it's a, it's a very good example of how science and deeper philosophical thinking intersect merge. yes yes that's that's fascinating and beautiful because i suppose what's uh, implicit in that are quite fundamental ideas around objectivity and subjectivity the inner and outer worlds and the way that they relate and it, it is our 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 tendency to regard that the world from see from an individualistic perspective po leads potentially to quite a lot of problems one of the things that i'm very curious about and like I know that your you know like rationalism reason and what's demonstrable is hugely significant and important but what fascinates me is that it seems that it certainly in earlier times people were relating to their own consciousness in ways that somewhat defy our rational understanding like people were having sort of yogic med meditative trips and now people like you know through ayahuasca and peyote and you know shamanic plants that people have always used have different experiences within consciousness that tackle the sort of ideas that you're saying science deals with now empirically and rationally and necessarily but the fact that there may be other avenues to you know again i would be reluctant to use a word as absolute as truth but th there are different avenues to understanding different avenues to insight fascinates me with the construction of mythologies as you said man is continually relating to his environment shaping to environment shaped by his environment uh, the, the the basis of well one of the bases i'm sure of evolution is that the way that we relate to external conditions and of course those conditions vary and uh, anthropological cultures that were uh, early adopters of agriculture have myths that demonstrate that where gods are sacrificed and put in the ground and hunter societies has, tend to be more individualistic the, you know the myths evolve to represent natural circumstance demonstrably but what i'm interested in uh, one of the things i'm interested in professor is how can we use as we've just uh, touched upon with that uh, idea that Oppenheimer said that, that it self echoed a spiritual idea uh, how can we use what we learn in science to inform our societies in bloody difficult times politically and globally what values can we extract well there, there are I'll answer that, and then I want to go back to something you said, which is about roots to insight, which I thought was really interesting. But the answer to that question directly is that um, Oppenheimer pointed out, so if you think about political philosophy, the way that we organise our society, so you might think that there are mutually contradictory axioms. So, for example, one could be uh, freedom of the individual. If you're libertarian, uh, extreme libertarian, you think that individual freedom is the most important thing. And you might be prepared to compromise a bit and build something in order to have a society, but ultimately you're talking about freedom as the the base, the basis. Whereas if you're on the, if you're a, a communist or further to the, to the left, you might be think that society is all that matters, and you might reluctantly build a bit of individual freedom in. And what Oppenheimer was saying with this idea of complementarity is the two ideas of freedom and society are inextricably linked they feed off each other they're both necessary for the other to exist mm. so you can't have freedom without a society and you can't have a society without freedom and it's but so the just the idea that you don't start saying i am a uh, conservative or i am a marxist or i am a whatever you you, you have to understand that human society and its interaction with individuality is very complicated. Yes, and you need to you, you need to understand. You need to be comfortable with holding those two ideas. We call them orthogonal in physics at right angles. The mutually contradictory ideas. Oh, I'm drawing. I'm drawing a little. That's good. Orthogonal, uh, ninety degrees to each other. You have to hold both of them in your head and be comfortable and understand that you need them both to get a full picture. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. There's another yeah. spiritual it's idea. Not, it's not contradictory, and you you have to do it in. in understanding quantum mechanics and that's the great thing because nature forces you to think like that so it's no longer optional which yes. is oppenheimer's key point yes you, you, so you're trained uh, you, you're forced to think in that way and that's very valuable 
Yes, but also, may I say, Brian, that the, the, the way that the semantics and these systems of taxonomy actually operate is a word like freedom is determined by the powerful. So freedom ultimately becomes, in what we can say in our society, freedom within limits and ultimately freedom to consume, freedom to behave in accordance with these ideologies. This is what freedom means. When political figures talk about they hate our freedoms or they're attacking our freedoms. What they mean by freedom is often indicated by the maxims they spout when in crises, e.g. go out and chop after 9-11 or there's no such thing as society from Margaret Thatcher these it's like these sort of momentary fissures with through which we can glance what they mean what is the state what what is their truth because you know like like we were discussing earlier in my somewhat uh, intentionally daft radio show um that um Oh God, no! I forgot what I was saying there. Sometimes I, come, I was operating on a level well, that was challenging. Yeah, I think me. What, we, what you've said is you've given examples of people who are convinced that they are mm. right. That and is the point. Yes, yeah, certainty. You said beware of people that are certain. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that you know, what really, if you think about what a free society is, then it means that there's a, a, a spectrum of viewpoints on every issue, and so you can imagine. I'd call it a distribution. With, and in mathematics, we call the tails of the distribution, which is the, the bits at the end. So most people might believe the stuff in the middle, but there are people on either side that believe other things. And if, if you have to, by definition, in a free society, find yourself occasionally at odds with the majority. That is a signal that you live in a free society, and you should celebrate it. And I think that the key lesson for me from, from just thinking rather more scientifically about things is that... Is, to understand that when you find yourselves in disagreement with other people, it is, a, it is a signal of a healthy democracy and a healthy society. And you should celebrate every time you find you're in, an outlier. You should be waving a flag. You should be running down the street cheering, going, I don't live in North Korea. That's what you should be doing. And, but that's been lost. Unless you do completely. live in North Korea, in which case, don't run down the street don't with do a flag. Don't say, I, <laughs> yeah, you'll so be shot. If you listen to this in North Korea, don't. But, <laughs> but the, I think we've lost that. You, you see it on, you know, I mean, we both, we're both on Twitter, and we, you see that the, the polarisation of debate means that people are just not thinking. They're not stopping and thinking. The fact that this person is saying something with which I disagree signals to me that our society is healthy. And the moment that nobody's saying things that I disagree with is the moment you should actually, then you should leave the country and run. Don't you think wrong. that what we're witnessing now is a time of uh, foreclosure around discourse, that more and more things are becoming taboo, that there's a re-emergence of censure? And, and the internet, as you've just indicated, is a very good example of that. These are the things that are unsayable. Furthermore, don't you think that the, you know, we have to say that there are ideologies, ideals are being set. There is such a thing as power. We're not living in a society that's constantly fluctuating in accordance to the will of the majority. We're living in a democracy where the function of democracy is to limit the capacity of people to impact its objectives and the, one of the problems of globalisation is that it has meant the establishment of elite that are not subject to sort of national or any kind of uh, regional law but they seem to live in a kind of what do I want to say a sort of a rarefied protected well, space except that um, what you've seen with the Brexit vote and, and I, I don't think it's the right route at all I mean I, I think that I'm a, a great fan of, of the European Union. However, what you've seen with the Brexit vote is extremely positive in the sense you're talking, because what you've seen is uh, a, a statement by the, a majority of people in the country that they reject the status quo. Sure, and, 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 I think and they have done it. They, they have rejected the status quo. A uh, prime minister resigned. There's now an absolute flux in politics, and and, and so I, I think that we it, do. Brian, I think we have to note two things here. One, it's a massive anomaly. It doesn't happen very often. Stuff like Brexit. That's why everyone's wetting themselves and all giggly and excited about yeah. it. No, not, and two, that Brexit in itself was an emotional reaction, not a rational reaction. People weren't going well because I want to see these trade it laws showed, altered. It was it um, emotions. You, but it showed you that the status 
status quo can be overturned in a democracy because at the moment we don't have a status quo. I would anymore. say within certain guidelines. I don't think, you know, when's the vote for? Now we're going to tax corporations at this rate. Now we're going to alter, uh, th- th- this is how we want to pay mortgages. This is how we want our societies run. You can argue that it may be that um, we see, for example, Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister, which would have been absolutely unthinkable um, t- t- two years ago. And, and, and if he does become prime minister, it will be as a result of the Brexit vote. That that will be the the, the route that a, a, a more radical politician uh, managed. To, that, that that's how a radical politician will have got into number ten. Now I, I I'm I'm I think Brexit is a mistake because I think that it that the people that voted to uh, to challenge the status quo are going to suffer the most from this. Um, the, the removal of the freedoms that we have to move around the Europe, Europe the, the removal of access to the single market, all those things. So I think actually it's the wrong solution. Possibly, but, unless but there I was. But I do think it's interesting democratically uh, that, that, it, that it, can, it can still unless, happen. Unless it does lead to a left wing government who use it as an opportunity to create new legislation around the behaviour of transnational corporations, different taxation laws. I mean, you know, there is. I was talking to someone in here recently about like a possible left wing outcome for Europe. I don't want to be dragged down a bloody Brexit quagmire when no, I've no, got no, a man no. who understands I, the bleeding no, universe. No, I don't really want to talk about I, I, I didn't plan to talk about that, but I think no, just, just, in no, the, it's a good demonstration. just in the context of what you're talking about, it, it, you could see it as a healthy attack on the status quo. You could see it. I, I don't think it'll have that result, but... No, I, I mean, I, I, but the fact that it's an anomaly is what concerns me. And the fact that we lower the threshold of what's acceptable for a democracy. See, we've got democracy. Once in a while, we can have a misguided, misguided carnival of disruption instead of no <laughs> democracy is. Why don't we control our communities and control our resources so that the most vulnerable people have access to power? That's democracy. If it's not that, it's not democracy. It's a th- piece of theatre. And like, and don't settle for that. Do you remember like, because you and I, we talked a little bit about because you, know, you were very keen that I encourage young people to vote at a point where I was saying it's pointless yeah. right? and like it was a sort of an interest because I, I, I sense that you and I have a lot more in common ideologically than we have dis- in separation even though you are a scientist and I'm a religious maniac and you are sort of pro-democracy and I'm pro-mass decentralisation and dissolution of power where possible you know but I feel that we're both driven by the idea we're essentially optimistic, is what I would say about you. You seem like an optimistic man. Yeah, I, and you have to be, because we go back to what we were talking about earlier about the the value of this place, the, the earth. And I, I think one of the... If I could... If there's one message that I would like people to, to take away from anything that I do, it's to, it's to value this place. And it's that's not some kind of, like... Uh, sort of hippie type thing is is it just a, based on the observation that the the the, the complexity of life that it, it, on earth it may well be it, it may make us quite a unique we could be unique in a galaxy for example i don't think i'm sure there'll be other civilizations out there in the billions of galaxies in the universe but it could be that the average is that there's about roughly one civilization per galaxy at any one time. And imagine mm. that. I mean, Arthur C. Clarke once famously said that there are two options. Either we are alone or we're not. And both are terrifying. Yeah. Right? But uh, I think we need to proceed on the basis that we are. Now, and imagine if, if people thought about that, which is just a matter of perspective. If people thought, actually, that if we uh, d- decided to have a nuclear war tomorrow accidentally perhaps and 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 destroyed intelligent life on the planet it may be that we destroy meaning in the galaxy right and and meaning i use advisedly because if you think about it meaning obviously exists in the universe because it means something to us so there are collections of atoms that somehow of of, of this property of meaning has emerged it means something to us if we go then there will be no meaning in this corner of the universe. I think meaning is local and it's temporary. And I think in accepting that... By, by which I mean it's in yes. my head and your head. But may I say, I don't think it's global. I mean, in a way, this, though, in a way, it's irrelevant whether there are other civilizations or this one's unique in, empirically. I mean, to, to, to us, it doesn't matter. Like, either life is beautiful or life isn't beautiful. Whether or not someone's over there having a beautiful time, to me, is sort of irrelevant. And also, terms such as local and temporal are highly subjective terms, as we have already established, that refer to patterns themselves that exist within a context, and our consciousness relates 
relates only to that context. So the meaning that emerges, it, like you know, the, whatever this thing is that transitioned from unlife to life through various gradients, geological to biological, and whatever preceded that and whatever follows that, meaning is one of its components. It's, it, ex- it exists as organically as trees. Yeah, yeah well, p- physicists, are, some scientists refer to it as an emergent property which is something that emerges from some more fundamental structure. I think this is probably the difference between us. I ask you a question, because I think that the great challenge of human existence is to come to terms with the fact that, that meaning exists, but it is, as I said, it, it's local in the sense that it's not universal. And I think that's the difference. If I was to define a difference between a religious person and a non-religious, I would say that, uh, well, it's a question to you, but I would say that religion is searching for global meaning, and I think it's local. And I think there will come a time in the life of the universe when there is no meaning left, because I think that as far as I we think we're approaching it, well, I mean, I think that's what I think. Though that's my tri- that's precisely the problem is that mat- materialism and rationalism lead to individualism, capitalism, and consumerism. We can see in real time what it leads to I politically more, and socially. I mean more brutally than that, though. I mean that in the f- far future of the universe, there won't be any suns left shining. So there won't be any atoms that can contemplate atoms anymore. In the, of course, in, in the, the universe. Fact, I, no, but, I understand but, that, and that is an, an enormous principle. thing to say, Brian, and, and I've got absolutely no bloody kit to argue with but you But even with, in but, principle, what does it but, mean to you? Can I ask you a question? What, what, does it, what do you feel like if I say there will come a time in the future yeah. when there is no consciousness in the universe and so so all possibility well, of meaning has gone but the universe will still be there i would say that within my philosophy consciousness and matter have the reverse relationship to in yours i believe that matterism emerges from consciousness not vice versa so even where the astrophysical context alters and evolves as you know brilliant men such as yourself and your predecessors have demonstrated that will happen that to me is essentially irrelevant because it's just part of the cosmic ballet continuing within the framework of consciousness and I underwrite this of course speculatively like all theories that are that bookend creation it's speculative as anybody else is but for me uh, the, the preceding the big bang there is consciousness consciousness that is not individualized consciousness that is not expressed through matter and this is not something that I would narrativize or use to underwrite or support any particular ideology it's not like you know a consciousness for white people or a consciousness for Muslims pure consciousness expressing itself through matter and that these patterns and habits that are so beautifully delineated these rules that discovered these rules that Herman Melville describes as all human sciences but passing fables as we discover what lies beyond them like that these are an expression of this consciousness so when eventually whatever it is that exists in instead of human beings, are consumed by the sun. That doesn't matter to me, because individuation, I believe, is temporal. That I am just part of a whole consciousness temporarily occupying this individual. Or I can't put it any better than Bill Hicks. We are one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. And I would say that the reason that geology becomes biology is because the geology is conscious, that consciousness is in all things. And the reason that we should love nature and love the earth and love one another is because we are all one. And there are motifs for this throughout our culture. Why are we moved by heroism? Because a person sacrifices themselves for another. Why? Because they know, in inadvertent commas, on some deeper level, that there is no distinction between self and other. This is merely the grid of the senses dealing with physical information. The experiencer receives, this is inside, this is outside, but ultimately and essentially those distinctions are animalistic attempts to understand limitless phenomena. So that's why it doesn't matter to me. Although I would say, like you, we have to regard this thing with love because love, in a very Christian sense, actually, like C.S. Lewis says, you feel like you're rewarded when you do a good thing and when you do a bad thing, you know that was bad. So let's just go with that. Be kind to one another, love one another, let people believe what they want to believe. So mine comes from that. And I'm not ashamed of the bits that sound a bit hippie because for me, love is an energy, love is a force. And whilst it's difficult to quantify and measure, without it, we are nothing. See, I think my view is uh, it's it's certainly bleaker, right? (laughs) What's the point in that? (laughs) Well, but but I think that actually the the road to, I would say that the road to wisdom is, is 
the, 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 the most challenging question that I face, given that I'm saying that matter and energy and the laws of nature exist and then life emerges from them. Mm. And then uh, there will come a time when there's no life. Uh, so that, that challenges you to say, what is the value then of life? Um, given that it is temporary and it emerges and it will go away again and there will be a time when the, mm. the universe is dark and there is nothing left and, and I think that it that, seems like you get some sort of delight from well, that well no, I, I do because I think that the, in the sense that the, the it, it, peace right as a human being I think comes from finding your accommodation with your temporary existence and and, le and learning that it's so the, the the temporary nature of it to me makes it more valuable mm. it's that a fine there's a tiny amount of time it's nothing in the life of the universe a tiny amount of time when we not only individually but as a human race can exist and explore and love the universe it's a finite tiny amount of time and i think that's a much more difficult accommodation to come to it but i think that's where i think that's really I, I think that's what reality is and so yes. we've got to come to accommodation with it but i think in that accommodation is the way you learn to love the planet and the people on it because you learn that they are temporary and valuable and fragile as long as it leads to that conclusion it sort of doesn't really matter but what i will say is we, we've, we've already acknowledged in the in this brief interview that our understanding of, of the temporal framework and the spatial framework are sort of breaking down the more we examine them. So why would we continue to use that framework to conjecture billions of years in the future when it's breaking down right now? Well, you can, I mean, the way we do it, by the way, is, is to get back to science, a thing called the Friedman equation, which comes from general relativity, from Einstein's theory published in 1915. And, and what Einstein's theory tells us is that there is a, a given thing which which is the fabric of the universe. It's called space-time. So there's a thing. And it doesn't tell you where it came from. It tells you there is such a thing. Mm. But it does tell you how that thing stretches and warps and deforms and changes in response to the matter and energy that are present in the universe. Mm. So you can calculate, given this amount of matter and this amount of radiation and dark matter and dark energy and all that, given all that stuff now what will it do in the future what is the response of the fabric of the universe in, to this stuff and that's what enables us to say with some confidence that unless there's new physics that mm. we don't understand and there might be but given what we know now the universe is, is accelerating in its expansion which we observe and it will come to a point where we think it will just double continually in size every 20 billion years or so forever Yes. And we can make that prediction, given what we know now. So there is, that's the baseline. So the baseline prediction is we are in the universe that will end up in what's called an exponential expansion, doubling in size every 20 billion years or so, forever. Beautiful. And life cannot exist indefinitely in such a universe. Of course not, but that's, a, that's necessarily a linear equation, and reality may be fractal, may be spiral. Right at the basis of that theorem is the acceptance, and we don't know where it comes from or where it's going, and it infers that it's, you know, as I know you've talked about a lot in your programmes, it's expanding into apparent nothingness, but don't you see like that? Our linguistic and indeed psychological tools, and neurological tools, I would imagine from your perspective, start to break down, and so this is again where I sort of uh, invite Right, sort of, you know, faith. I just want to say one thing. It is a theory that is tested. So it is the theory that allows us to build, for example, the satellite navigation system. Yeah. So quite I'm not having a go at bloody Einstein so, so or satellite navigation it systems. It does work. No, no, of so, course so, it does. Yeah, but, that's, within, that's, but it's a model. But, but Brian, when you say satellite navigation systems are fast, fantastic though they are, these are not tools that we're going to use to measure the expanse of a universe doubling in millions of years. This is a localised bit of information <laughs> that applies to us as carnal it's beings. I mean, just, just a, a quick explanation of how we know it's expanding at all is because it's, it's a simple observation mm. that if you look at the light from a distant galaxy, um, then you find that it's stretched. So quite literally, I mean, the colours changed. It's called red shift. So it's a light as a wavelength and the long wavelengths are red and the shorter wavelengths are blue. And what you find is light that should have been blue, because you see it coming from a particular kind of atom in that galaxy, is actually now red. And the explanation is that space has been stretching during the time the light has been travelling. And what you find is the further the galaxy is away, 
the more the light is stretched, which is exactly what you'd expect if you live in an expanding universe. And by making those measurements, you can measure how fast the universe has been expanding over it, it's, billions of years. And it's, it's a sim- no, quite of course, a simple observation. No, no one could refute it, and it's absolutely beautiful. And I only I know that already, and the reason I know already is because I've watched you explain it yeah. elegantly and in a way that makes sense to me and is meaningful to me. But what I would add to that is we see red, we see blue, we somehow within our minds experience red, we experience blue, we have eyes, we have senses, we live in this realm where something is experiencing something. And like you uh, said, atoms experiencing other atoms. Now, what we have to continually acknowledge is that that there is a finite ability to understand information. There is evidently limitless information. At some point, we're going to hit a wall and you know and continue the one what exists beyond that is theories conjecture imagination and it's curious to me that it, steeped in our theological history there were people speculating in similar ways and reaching similar conclusions of course no one can as, um, as accurately say that's because space is stretching so you experience red as different because waves travel different through the different density of space and people aren't saying stuff like that but people are speculating and trying to understand the phenomena of limitlessness. You reminded me, yeah, and you reminded me about something you said earlier. Oh, that yeah, I yeah, to talk insight. About, which is this, which is that... So, so I would say that where I would... I would disagree with you in, in a sense in that the, uh, finding out the way that nature works, I think, is the... is, is, is only done through what we might loosely call the scientific method right which is which is making observations and building theories and checking them mm. however it's not surprising to me that someone had a thought a few thousand years ago which turns out to be in accord with what we discover I, I, well, where i would disagree is i don't think that they had those thoughts by some royal road to the truth or something i don't think that i, I think that they so, so let's say that you, you say in, in some context, a religious context or theological context a few thousand years ago, we think that... Let's we just live, say, for the think, sake of argument, in the Quran. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, put it back so, about Gita, <laughs> they're less leery. Let's say we, we say we think that we live in an expanding universe. Mm. So we think there's points of light in the sky or other worlds, as, as people did say, mm. and, and, and we think they're all rushing away from, each, for, from us. Right, and um, then... Uh, so, so well certainly for the galaxies this is true so but the, the fact that someone said that is something you could imagine saying you can imagine looking up at those points of light mm. and dreaming that there are the worlds um actually giordano bruno famously did that and got burnt at the stake in rome in uh, and his ashes thrown into the tiber i think as part of the new year's celebrations i can't remember well done go and expand across the tiber in yeah, limitless exactly. particles but because he said that he said i think these are other worlds and and worlds without end limitless Beautiful. worlds it, it, and now he had no reason to say that it was pure thought but it is something that you can imagine someone saying very poetically now he turned out to be right but i don't think that i think the fact that he was right was coincidental i don't think he had some path route to knowledge through meditation that I don't think there is a route to knowledge of nature through meditation. There may well be, I'm sure there is, a route to inner peace and a better understanding mm. of yourself and your relationship with nature. But I, I, would, I do not think that you can find out, uh, you could build new physical theories by... By meditating, um, by by meditating no, alone. I, I agree with you. you. By thinking, I mean, I have to just correct myself. Yeah, slightly, because what is it I, when someone has a flash of intuition or inspiration? All this thing is, and all this information is entering the world through people's consciousness. The way you check it is by doing science. Definitely so check it through science. Yeah, I, don't know, I was just dreaming about something. I refuse to check it. <laughs> you know, that is wrong. Yeah. That's a, like you know, like I think from whatever angle you approach it, when you get into dogma and doctrine and telling people what to do and what they can be and what they can't be, I think you get into really dire territory um from my perspective where the bias is is you know has gone towards you know sort of science particularly economic science particularly from political science like what you know i watch your programs i watch you talk about the way that water's behaving and pebbles in lakes and the life of strawberries and for me this is awesome and beautiful and glorious and precisely what we need to examine and track but what i feel is is somehow the same way as the you know one could say the philosophy of christ was used to 
underwrite a great big powerful economic institution that ends up saying don't put that there vis-a-vis people's anatomy is you know that people use science to say don't think that live there obey these rules yeah and this is this you're right that this is entirely wrong because science science is a body of knowledge It, it doesn't tell you anything really well it doesn't tell you anything about how to how, what, what to make of that knowledge I mean it can tell you there are two trillion galaxies in the observable universe full stop it doesn't tell you what that means right what, what are you to make of that uh. it doesn't tell you it's the same with uh, and we're going to go back to Oppenheimer you know the, the idea that so you can build an atomic bomb and science tells you, it gives you the knowledge such that you can build an atomic bomb. It certainly does not tell you what to do with it, right? I mean, actually, we would argue that yes. common sense tells you not to use it. Right? But <laughs> don't, don't press that button. It's a, but, um, so so I, I think that's a key point. That, so, so for me, the, the, the proper interaction between science and religion and philosophy and theology and art and music and literature, all those things is that, that they go together yes. to allow us to build a, a, a view of, of what our place in the universe is and what it yes. means to be human. None of them on their own will allow you to build that idea, to come to that oh. conclusion. What does it mean to be human? But, but you need them all. That's so beautiful, isn't it? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, that you have to come together. And that means that one of the things that you've mentioned a lot, Brian, is humility, that, that there needs to be humility in all these communities. And, and in a sense, an idea of an objective, like you said about sort of uh, with the libertarianism, ultimate individualism, communism, sort of a, a version of uh, this sort of subjugation of the individual in favour of the state. We have to, to in order to build systems, human systems that make sense to us, it is going to need to be a collaboration between science, spirituality, art, theology, and all these taxonomies are interchangeable because one man's spirituality is another man's science. And I, I recognise that what you're saying is on the bandwidth of material energy that can be measured, magnified, shrunk, weighed out, double blind tested, there are certain things that we can say on this plane are factual at this time, at this moment, on this level. I think the crisis that we're going through at the moment as a civilization is we don't have a point. There isn't a meaning to our civilization. And I, I just made a, yes. a program a, a while ago about um, commercial space flight and talked to people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, um, the, these entrepreneurs who are trying to go out beyond the earth. And they all share a philosophy, a certain philosophy, which is that humanity, if you're looking for meaning, what drives us, we need frontiers. We need frontiers of knowledge. Uh, which you might call intellectual or even spiritual frontiers and physical frontiers we need somewhere to go Carl Sagan once said that somewhere out there there's something waiting to be known how beautiful <laughs> and uh, so so we, we we don't have that on the earth anymore there are no frontiers right there are obviously bo- political borders but there are no places that we haven't been there's no wild west to push into and so they think that the next step to go out upwards to the stars to step onto the moon and to mars and beyond that that's the place where our hu- where we will find meaning again well i hope purpose possibly again. they are right and it's certainly very intrepid but i would query the idea that we are without frontiers because there are certain ideological and metaphysical spaces that we have not tried to access we have not here on earth. what but what value is it if we start building new societies on mars if down here on bloody earth we're treating each other appallingly yeah. there are basic principles that you know that have found their way into common consciousness mostly through spirituality even long 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 before monotheism pantheonistic cultures all find versions of look after one another that's not to say there isn't you know and you would know much more than me a kind of brutality in nature whether it's zoology or astronomy there's a brutality and a finality but are these the principles that we want to be governed by as human beings for the frontiers I would be interested in traversing and heading towards I equality, love, new systems that give us once again a vision so that the exploration of space becomes valid, but not once again the pursuit of economic power, the pursuit of dominions, dominions new. We've conquered and subjugated Mother Earth. Let's see what other planets we can fuck up. Well, 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 one, of the, one of the ideas is that um, how do you develop new political systems? So if you look at, for example, the uh, America, so, so the, 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 the movement from Europe into America, um, d- d- ended up with the American Constitution, um, and so there are, there are obviously there were 
pros and cons of that. Yes. <laughs> living there. Steady, Brian. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Slavery. Well, exactly. But, but you got Genocide. this. Genocide. One of the things you got was this document, which I think is widely recognised as one of the, 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 the most important statements of how you might It's a nice a poem, but if it doesn't relate to the way you run a society, then what value is it? And this is precisely the problem. Now it is not put the, into practice. If you grow up, and even then, Brian, it was, except for these people, you know, except for women, except for these people that live here already, oh, except exactly. for... But, if so, you look, but, but the point is... Is that no, there's certainly of, there is a relationship between the physical and the spiritual. That if we grow into new territories physically, there is a possibility that it will somehow help us to discover within ourselves new notions. But like we can do that without getting on a spaceship. We could just start saying let's not judge people according to what they look like, or you know, like one of the ideas is that, that our, our system on this planet now has become quite ossified. Right? What's, what's that difficult. mean? Like a fossil? Well, stiff. yeah, fossilized, locked in, ossified. Uh, whereas if you go to if you imagine that in, in, in 100 years time or something we have the, the, the Mars colony is, is looking to become independent and the, the, then the, the, the act of going to a new place and beginning again can allow you to access different ways of being and different ways of interacting that might not be possible here because of the historic borders and, and, and problems that I mean, we have here I sort of so agree but that doesn't make me want to get on a spaceship that makes me want to get on a barricade no, it makes me want to change the world it makes me say like if we've reached a sort of a, a point of crisis like for me it's not like oh bloody hell let's go somewhere else for me it's like we've going to have to change I mean like you like will know that the, the one area where science is not being allowed to it, well, not the one but a, an area where science is not being allowed to inform the way we treat the planet is with climate change people are not going right steady because the, for me one of the things I've learned over the course of these podcasts and I must say it's one of the ones that's been like a great big iceberg of information smashing into my consciousness uh, and hopefully I can stay afloat unlike the, uh, the other vessel in that analogy is that um, is that all our ideologies are caveated by and as long as it doesn't affect the interests of the powerful, we must do something about climate change. As long as it doesn't affect the interests of the powerful, we must have fair assets. As long as it doesn't in- impact the interests. So for me, this is about finding ways of impact the interests of the powerful. Until we are prepared to do that, until we're prepared to address that frontier, there's no point in jumping on Elon Musk's spacecraft or saying, yeah, perhaps it is a virtual reality experiment. We have to start saying, right, ooh, what is happening? Right, these people are behaving in this way. Right, well, that's got to be regulated and stopped and stripped. You're right. I mean, Interesting though, Jeff Bezos, who's the Amazon CEO, who's got oh. his company Blue Origin, and um, he said to me, first of all, why is his company called Blue Origin? Because it, it refers to the Earth, the, the Blue Origin of humanity. And he said that the one thing we've learnt in our exploration of the solar system and beyond is that this planet is the best one. Right? We've learnt that. Number one. Um, that means that it is a jewel. He calls it a jewel of a planet, and therefore we must protect it. At the same time, we have a large population which is making increasing demands on the resources. So what is the solution? How do you support an expanding population, all of whom want a better life for them and their children, at the same time as protecting this beautiful blue planet? The answer is to get the resources from elsewhere. That's the answer. Well, that's an answer. Another one would be to start prioritising the health of the planet above economic needs. That, I mean, well, like, as long as you've got capitalism uh, in the form it's now in, which many people would argue is way beyond capitalism, then then it's inevitable. And what Marxist critical theory, the, the first discovery, page one is, this is a limited resource. We are, It cannot provide limited growth. Well, in, in, so I, like, that's got to go you then. You may well have a... You, you can argue that you have a point in, in Europe... North America, um, the West, that you might call it. But if you talk about sub-Saharan Africa or India or large parts of China, um, it is difficult to see how you can lift those people out of poverty at the same time as reducing the demands on the planet because those people are there and they live in poverty. And it's right that they aspire to a better life for their children. But the, the answer... Can, can be innovation. I mean, for example, I was in China about two weeks ago and uh, they just cancelled the building of 150 coal-fired power stations. Cancelled it. And the reason they cancelled it was because solar power is cheaper. So it was absolutely purely, it was partly market-driven decision, partly because they have a problem with pollution in the cities. But, it, but it, the point is that innovation has delivered a solution because solar power makes no impact on the planet at all. Beautiful. So, like, you know, so once you know that wisdom is acting on knowledge, once we've that, the facts just in, the next thing should be a round of phone calls like, hey, guess what? Now, solar power only, as quickly as possible. But now, that, who do, do. whose interests do you challenge when you make that edict? 
you know so uh, well, well actually I've got to say very quickly I know you need to finish it it says 2.30pm you've got to stop but, uh, guess where I'm it? going I'm literally going to church Are you? <laughs> to do a reading <laughs> do you know I was talking to Brian Cox earlier today and uh, but, but uh, there's a guy who sat next to me on the panel and he was a Hong Kong uh, property developer and, and, and he said uh, that, that one of the things about China that, that's rather which is good is that the, the the interests the, those fossil fuel interests like those big companies that it doesn't it doesn't exist in China the the, the ruling party make the decision they made mm. a decision based on we don't want pollution we want less pollution because it's killing our people and we want cheap accessible power that is solar so immediately I will draw a line through a hundred and fit the contract for a hundred and fifty coal fired power stations and I'll change it to solar panels done and and he said he he argued uh, I. There are obviously counter arguments, but he argued that that's why have China will, 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 will. He said to me, "That's why China will beat you. It yeah. will beat you because we will make decisions like that." Now we could debate that for a whole other hour, could. but it's interesting. And one thing that sort of is, is distinct is that China it, it comes from a different philosophical tradition, has a completely different Weltanschauung, so it's able to to make decisions like that. Not just because of Maoism and post Mao communism, but because of the philosophies that preceded it. Brian Cox, I just want to say, just because I, when people are listening, I, I know that there are big problems with human rights and all this thing in China. I'm not waving the flag for the Chinese system. I'm just saying <laughs> there are systems within which those interests matter a lot less. Yes, there are. There are. And that's the, what is interesting to me. What, what I feel, Brian Cox, is that you have been kind of, in my language, a, uh, a prophet and an educator and a swami for such valuable, beautiful information. And uh, like, uh, who knows what the future holds? Uh, for me, you know, you get my vote on the next David Attenborough deal. Like, I mean, like I, I see you as very much the human voice of science. But for me, like as you have indicated there needs to be many voices in the human conversation for us to have a chance and uh, uh, once again what I feel like is that there is much to learn from the realms that can never be empirically demonstrated and uh, like I know that sounds quite high minded but I'm simply talking about love and kindness and the ability for ordinary people for to have their needs met and to have Carl impact Sagan. on the power. Carl Sagan said for small creatures such as we the vastness is bearable only through love. All oh, right, Carl Sagan. Let's give him the last word. Brian Cox, I want you to, uh, on record, make a commitment to come back and be interviewed again. Would you do that? Yes, whenever you want. I enjoyed it very much. I will be back tomorrow if you want. Uh, I really love <laughs> so talking to you. I thought it might get intense because we're coming at things from quite different positions, but I absolutely adore you and I'm very grateful to you for the education. Thank you. I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks, man. Cheers. <laughs>